Hello, Richard Herring here. Welcome to my free special stand-up show. All the cool kids are doing it. This is my last tour show from 2007-2008 called Oh Frig I'm 50. But I am excitingly about to go back out on tour again in the spring and summer of 2024 with a new show, Can I Have My Ball Back? Uh, all about my testicular cancer. I had testicular cancer. I don't really like to talk about it. Um, I'm coming everywhere. Uh, I'm going to the Pound Art Centre, Luton, the Berry Hedge End, loads of gigs in London, St Albans, Gloucester, Chorley, Glasgow, Pocklington twice, Doncaster, Scarborough, Stockton, Swindon, Cambridge, Leicester, Leeds, Salford, Newcastle, Bridport, Ipswich, Portsmouth, Basingstoke, Cheltenham, Monmouth, Carlisle, Lancaster, Barnard Castle, I'm not going to do the obvious joke and that's a guarantee, Worcester, Shrewsbury, Alton, Froome, Bristol, Sheffield, Guildford, Norwich and Andover. And I bet some more will be added at some point down the line. Go to richardherring.com slash gigs or richardherring.com and click on my tour page. Uh, you'll be able to see everywhere I'm coming and get the links. But if you want to get an idea of what my stand-up's like, here I am in all my two-balled glory, making jokes about swinging my testicles around and having no idea what fate had in store for me. Uh, I'd love you to come see me live, but do enjoy this special stand-up for free. I'm just too nice to you guys. Run. Please welcome Richard Herring! Thank you very much! Hello, London! Thank you very much! Queen Elizabeth Hall, motherfuckers! Welcome to the show! Amazing, thank you. Welcome to the show, it's called Oh Frig, I'm 50. Uh, I know I don't look it, stop shouting out, you're just embarrassing yourself. So it's 10 years ago, I did a show called Oh Fuck, I'm 40. I thought it'd be a nice idea to do a show like this every 10 years to chart the progress of ageing. So welcome to the penultimate instalment of the franchise. <laughs> Who am I kidding, I'll never get a 60, look at me. I'm, I'm out of breath already, look at <laughs> Can't believe I'm 50. I've just got over the existential dread of turning 40. I've clicked my fingers and bang, another decade has disappeared into the ether. And what have I got to show for it? A wife and two children, big deal. <laughs> A viable career, whoopee doo. <laughs> Happiness, fuck off. It's just so old, 50. Someone who was 50 on the day I was born was born during World War I. That's how. That's how old I am. <laughs> and we recently bought a puppy, because um, we've moved to the countryside. You have to when you're 50, that's the law. Um, I realised that dog is the first pet I've ever owned that has a realistic chance of outliving me. <laughs> when I buy a bag for life now, I think, yeah. <laughs> Probably, isn't it? Probably. <laughs> I started thinking bags for life might have this totemistic power. They're literally bags for life. As long as you can keep them all. I've got about 10 at the moment. I'm immortal. <laughs> Every single one I lose, that's a little bit of my life force ebbing away. Things have started going wrong, of course. They don't warn you about it, fellas. Ladies get a bit of warning about what's coming up in midlife, but they, they just spring on us, fellas. We don't get any warning. I'm going to warn you now, any younger fellas. Gravity takes its effect on men as well as women. When you're 50, there's a genuine possibility you might sit on one of your own testicles. <laughs> no one, no one warns you about that, do they? Every time I sit down now, I kind of try to get this sort of <laughs> centrifugal force thing. If one go in one way and one go in the other, if they touch at the top, I know I'm safe. That's, that's my system. And that's in proportion, man. And that is where they meet. That is how <laughs> awful things have become. The intensity of your orgasm diminishes. No one told me about that. That's not fair, is it? It should go up as a kind of reward. <laughs> if there was a God, he'd go, well done, mate, you got a 50. I'm going to ramp that up a little bit for you. He'd, he'd do that for us, fellas. He loves blokes. But um, 
It goes down, it proves evolution. Evolution goes, yeah, no point in wasting any valuable resources in this redundant area, let's move those elsewhere. Now, when I come, sometimes it's just like my penis has sneezed. Not even that, it's like my penis has thought it was going to sneeze. It's, ah, uh, ah, uh, oh no, but you're right, it's fine. It's, um, Ironically, the intensity of my sneezes has gone through the roof. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> and the knees have gone a bit, of course. I can still run. I'm just electing not to currently. Um, so when I kneel down, it really hurts here, which is a problem. I've got a three-year-old daughter. She's always on the floor, the tiny idiot. Um, I went to the doctor. I said, it really hurts when I kneel down. You, you know what he said? Don't kneel down. That's right. It's, you get a 50. They don't even bother with running repairs. They go, no, come on, mate. It's nearly at the end. Can't you just take a seat, wait for the... Inevitable. It's not, we don't want to waste any medicine on you. It'd be like flushing it down the toilet. Come on, think of, think of the youngsters who've got their future ahead of them. My life's so different than it was 10 years ago. Me at 40, me at 50, we're like two unlikely flat share characters in some awful sitcom. Uh, when I was 40, I was single, going out, getting pissed every night, going through a proper full-on midlife crisis, hanging around with people half my age, having sex with different people every night, just nameless faceless strangers. No, oh, it was so shallow and empty. There was no love. It was meaningless. In the end, the whole thing just made me very happy. It, it, was, it was awesome. I'm trying to remember why I gave it up now. I'm racking my brains. Now I'm 50, I'm married, two kids, a lot of responsibility, a lot of stress, so I still drink quite a lot, but it's on my own in the basement when everyone else is asleep, which, that's the best kind of drinking. Don't let anyone tell you social drinking is the best. The best drinking is when you know everyone else in the house is finally asleep. You've got 15 minutes to drink yourself into a stupor before you pass out from exhaustion. That is... <laughs> my life's so different, it's unbelievable. The other morning, I found myself up at six o'clock putting a pair of tiny girl's pants onto a toy monkey. Um, my daughter had asked me to do that. It's not my hobby. It's like, oh, oh, better get up nice and early so I can get a couple hundred of those in before breakfast. It's... She was putting on her pants. I was putting them on for her. She's got a favourite toy monkey. It's called Uu. It's a clever name. Uh, she wanted Uu to wear pants as well. But if you told me ten years ago, I'd be up before the sunrise putting tiny floral knickers onto a stuffed chimpanzee. I'd have said, oh, so I've got kids in ten years then, right? <laughs> only explanation, and that's the only... That must be what's happened, right? Is it... Was that a good use of your time travel powers to come back a decade just for that <laughs> one piece of information? Nothing else happened since 2008 you want to warn the world about? No, just the pants on the monkey, yes. To honest, that sounded like quite a spontaneous moment that you've just ruined with your spoilers. Fuck off back to the future. That is what I would have said. <laughs> said that to me ten years ago. That's the best routine in the show, incidentally. It, it never, um, <laughs> never gets all that much, but I've been doing stand-up comedy for 30 years now. My sense of humour is better than yours. <laughs> and all the other audiences who've seen that routine. And that is staying in the show. Regardless of what you think about it. <laughs> But, you know, <laughs> 10 years ago, I don't miss that 40-year-old. He was such an idiot. He was a drunken, libidinous fool, led everywhere by his penis, every decision he made. Oh, just awful. I'm glad he's dead. The ghost of him still haunts me. I'll be walking down the street, a pretty young girl will walk past and go, oh, look at that, wouldn't mind a bit of that. Uh, are you going to do anything about it, mate? No. No. <laughs> what, you respect your marriage vows too much? No, it's just, it's a lot of effort, isn't it? I'm so... <laughs> I'm so tired. I just, please, I just want to go to sleep. Please, I wish, I wish I was dead. Can you kill me? I just want to die. <laughs> Ten years ago, young women still found me attractive. I, when, I was, when I was 40, women in their 20s were flirting with me, sending me saucy messages on social media, trying to get off with me. The minute I met my wife, that stopped. And I don't think it's because people think, oh, he's happy in a relationship now. We better leave him alone. I think I genuinely met my wife as I was on the turn. It was, I was good looking, she said she'd go out me, bang, I turned into this melted wax candle, Quasimodo version of myself. She's stuck with me now, we're married, that's it, there's no way out. That's got her, that's the, just in time for me, I was like Indiana Jones grabbing my hat at the last possible second, while simultaneously drinking from the wrong grail. 
combining the beginning and the end of the Indiana Jones trilogy, which is all I recognise, sir. There are only three of those films. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't want to have sex with anyone else. I love my wife, but I would just like it if young women still found me attractive. Just for my ego, I just would like it if women were trying to have sex with me, but they're, they're not. Uh, just to prove my resolve, how much I love my wife. Because is there any virtue in fidelity if nobody is trying to fuck you? <laughs> there isn't, is it? It's meaningless. I can say to my wife, I haven't had sex with anyone all the time we've been together. How many people have tried? Not a soul, is that relevant? Oh, what's the relevance of that? I don't see the... I'd just like it if every week 10 very attractive young women did their best to seduce me. At the end of the week, I'd go to my wife say, 10 women tried to have sex with me this week, and I turned nine of them down. That is, that's a 90% success rate. That is an A grade in any exam system. It's a weird thing about fidelity. If you fuck up once or you fuck up a thousand times, it's essentially the same punishment. So if you've been unfaithful, carry on. That is... If this show has a message, I suppose that is the, <laughs> the take-home message of the show. But, uh, but, oh, God, you know, it was just about acceptable for me to be hanging around with women in their 20s when I was 40. It was a little bit sad, but it was just about all right. Now, even if I wanted to, it would be impossible. We're on two different continents, and those continents have drifted too far apart. There's the continent of the young and the continent of the incontinent, and I'm very much in that side. <laughs> I'm a very young old person. It's better than being a very old young person. That's the way I'm trying to justify it to myself. Like 50, it's too, it's too young, and they're too young. It's someone 50 and so it's a bit too hot. Paul Hollywood, isn't it? It's like, ah, ugh, ah, ah. And people in their 20s, young people, they don't even see you when you're 50. You, they just they look straight through you, walking down the street. They don't even notice you. There's some 20-year old people in the audience tonight going, when's it coming on? When's the show starting? And I thought, God. When you're 50, to women in their 20s, you're essentially wearing a cloak of invisibility, which I thought would be okay, but the cloak loses its magic if you start masturbating. <laughs> oh, oh, you can see me now, Kenny. That's interesting. Now, now I've got my penis out. That's very, you're a pervert. You disgust me. Just let me finish. Um, <laughs> Oh God, I finished five minutes ago. There's no visible signs. There's no, there's no even sensation in this thing. I'm shooting dust here. <laughs> but I'm not the only one. You know, I think a lot of men get to this age and they struggle with this. Because as a, as a white middle class man, you live your whole life with this air of privilege. You're not even aware it's there. Everyone's trying to please you. You get to 50, they're not that bothered anymore. They don't make the effort. You get to find out what it's like to be anyone else on the planet Earth. And it's... It's difficult for men to cope with. That's why I think they go so crazy. Midlife crisis, all the stuff that's happening in the news. It's down to these guys not being able to accept the loss of their attractiveness, the loss of their libido. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a crazy thing. And the society is all just built around this idea that older men have to be with younger women to be virile. It's pathetic. I don't know if you remember uh, the Nespresso advertising campaign from a couple of years ago. Uh, Nespresso, it's a coffee delivery system for lazy middle-class idiots. I'm <laughs> sure everyone in this building has one. I um, it's... <laughs> in the advert, it was... Uh, Jack Black and George Clooney. Jack Black plays this bumbling, sexual, repugnant idiot who can't even say the two-word Nespresso tagline correctly and consequently is a failure with women. But with the help of sexy, tortoise-mouthed George Clooney... <laughs> no? George Clooney has a mouth very like a tortoise. I I'm surprised that doesn't get more recognition than it does because he's seen as the sexiest man on the planet. He literally has a tortoise's mouth on his face and it's... It's not in proportion. It's a very small tortoise on the face of a regular-sized human being. He looks ridiculous. How he's become the sexiest man on the planet, I don't know. Hats off to him for having overcome this disability. But uh, you're going to get home Google that. Go, how have I not noticed that before? That's incredible. It's, a lot of this show is going to be enjoyed retrospectively. Um, <laughs> eight or nine months down the line, you go, oh, I get the thing about the pants on the monkey. That was really clever. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to give, give Richard a ring and give that the laughter it deserved. He must have been... How offend we must have offended him very badly. <laughs> so with the help of George Clooney, Jack Black uh, drinks from a Lilliputian cup of once fresh coffee, and consequently a woman young enough to be his daughter, if only he'd managed to have sex before he discovered Nespresso. 
wants to fuck him. Because women can't resist men who drink coffee that comes in pre-packaged pods but can only be made with compatible machines. That's what you're after in the girls, that's the secret. That's, what it, that's the answer, Dr. Freud. You don't want to drink the coffee yourself, that's how passive you are. You want to watch a fat man drinking it, that is... Having passed on the secret of his success to the too symmetrically faced funny man. Come on, Jack Black. Incredibly symmetrical face. You must have noticed that. Usually symmetry is a very attractive prospect in a human being, but with Jack Black, his face is so symmetrical, it goes all the way, all the way around past infinity, comes out hideously ugly again. There's... If you could get together as a group and Google this together and then record your laughter and email it to me. I think that would be the, that would be the fairest way of doing this. <laughs> Jack, George Clooney looks over at Jack Black. He crinkles his testudine lips. It means tortoise-like. And he pulls a face. I'm not even exaggerating. Exactly like Sid James in a carry-on film. It's exactly, this, this is the face. This isn't over the top. That's what he does. That's what he's doing. It's like old man stepped on, God, Jack, God, fucker, fucker, the stupid coffee addict bitch. It's disgusting. I'm presuming the next advert in the campaign shows Black and Clooney double teaming some bamboozled young starlet, using her back as a coffee table as they, they high five each other and their old man balls drag on the ground creating furrows in the earth <laughs> that will one day be used to plant more coffee beans to make more disgusting stale Nespresso coffee as they try and fail to achieve a satisfying orgasm. <laughs> it's not even an advert for Nespresso, it's a public information film for middle-aged men. If these Hollywood superstars look this bad, imagine how awful you're looking, stop it! The young people can see you, they just have to pretend they can't because your face is frozen into a mask of lechery. It's disgusting. <laughs> I still bought an espresso machine though because there's, <laughs> there's just a chance. There's just a chance. If I drink a tiny cup of coffee and pull a face like a turtle, maybe you'll want to fuck me. That's all I want, man. I just, I just want to want it. I want you to fuck me. I want you to want to fuck me. I don't want to fuck. Oh, I fucked it up. Uh, <laughs> It was like there was a voice in my head saying, no, Rich, you want to fuck her. No, I don't. I want you to. In this instance, maybe. I've got it wrong. But I want you to want to fuck me. I don't want to fuck you. I want you to want to fuck me. Because I am a very happily married man now. I'm very, I'm very happily married. You can look, but you can't touch. Those are the new rules. Uh, drink this in, seriously. Uh, undress me with your eyes. That's uh, You've been doing it already now. At least you have my consent. Take a little mental picture for the wank bank layer. That's... Believe me, I'm doing the same for you. So it's... <laughs> no, I've been with my wife for over 10 years now. It's amazing. We've been married for six years, and I can't believe I didn't realise this when I was younger, that married people in the audience know this. It's just so amazing, isn't it, to be in a monosnogamous relationship. It's, it's just... <laughs> I wouldn't go back to the old days even if I could. I wouldn't. I would, even if my wife sadly died. I would... <laughs> I would, I'd probably, I don't know, I'd, 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 mourn, I'd mourn her, probably, if that had mourn. I <laughs> haven't really given it much thought. <laughs> and we've got two wonderful kids now. I'm loving being a dad. I can't believe I didn't, I've, I've got, we've got a three-year-old, six-month-old. Why have I left this so long? I'm 50 years old, it's ridiculous, I'm an idiot. I should have three families by now. I should have a 30-year-old son who resents the fact my third wife is only seven years older than him. That's where I should be. I deeply regret missing out on that life experience. My kids are amazing and my daughter's three years old. She's just such a character already. The other morning she's having breakfast, she's eating some cereal. She said, Daddy, I want a fork. I said, what? She said, I'm just joking. Oh, it's brilliant. Oh, uh, she's... <laughs> that comedy gene's definitely passed on down there. That is just the kind of stuff I would do. Um, she's crazy. The other day I was pushing her on a swing. Every time the swing got to the top, she was just grabbing it, thin ass. I pushed it, she went, grab. I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm trying to catch the clouds. I said, 
they're like 5,000 feet in the air. How, how high do you think this swing is going? This is miles off. It's pathetic. I think she's got some kind of brain damage or something. Is that <laughs> terrible, isn't it? I think I'm really clever, you know, because I'm so clever. I just thought it would be genetically impossible for me to have a stupid child, which is... You know, I mean, I'd love her almost as much as I would do if she was intelligent. <laughs> The other day she was wearing sunglasses. She said to me, Daddy, I'm wearing sunglasses so the sun can't see me. I genuinely think she's on crack. Come on, that is... <laughs> the other day I was in bed. Uh, my wife was getting her up. She, could, she didn't think I could hear. She was saying to her, Mummy, Mummy, Daddy eats wee-wee and poo-poo. How dare she? I told her that in confidence. That is way out of order. I'm never, never trusting her again with any piece of information. We have a second child, six months old. It's a boy. Uh, the woman doing the 20-week scan said he was very prominently a boy. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> like father, like son? Because yeah. I have a tiny fetus-sized penis. Um, <laughs> to be fair, this would look large on a 20-week fetus. If you, if, you saw, if you saw this hanging off a 20-week fetus, you'd be like, that's a well-hung fetus. So wouldn't mind a bit of that. You're only human, but... On a grown man, it looks uh, faintly ridiculous, but I want to make it clear, size is not important. It's what you do with it that counts. I don't know what I'm doing with it. That's the only drawback with that, but... We wanted to know the sex at 20 weeks, but the woman doing the scan, uh, she, she zoomed in, she went, there he is, there's this little Willie, can you see, he's a, he's a boy, you know, good, that's good. But every time she went past it, she would zoom in on that area. Again, there he is, there's his balls, can you see his little Willie? Yeah, yeah, we saw it, thanks. Oh, there he is again, can you see, there's his little... Little winky there, can you see? Do you even work at the hospital? What's going on here? <laughs> this child hasn't even been born yet. There isn't even a name for what you are. <laughs> People have been suggesting pre-defile, but you know, that's fine. It's, um... A lot of people find it amusing that I'm such a doting uh, dad uh, because um, I used to do a lot of anti-kid material in the past. Um, I used to do a routine about how children are sexual excrement that you have failed to dispose of in a considerate manner. Um, <laughs> sex excrement. Uh, I did a routine about how children are incapable of love, which I still stand by, incidentally. I, uh, my daughter rings me on FaceTime when I'm on tour. She goes, I love you, Daddy, but she doesn't know what the words mean. She's three. Love's about empathy. It's about understanding the world from someone else's point of view. It's about giving more than you take. A child doesn't understand any of those things. They're the centre of their own universe, looking after number one. For a long time, they don't even realise that you're individual people. They think you're just extendable limbs that bring them food. They're, they're just out for what they can grab and stuff into their stupid, greedy faces. They... They need you, I suppose. They depend on you, maybe. They say they love you because they've worked out that's a good way to get free crisps, but they, <laughs> they can't love you. People get annoyed with me. They say, I don't care what you say, which you're because parental love is the most impressive love in the world. No, it isn't. All right, I'm a parent now. I love my kids with all my heart. It's overwhelming, but there's nothing impressive about it because you just do love your kids, don't you? It just, it washes over you. It's instinctive. There's nothing you can do about it. Don't show off about loving your own kids. If you hate your kids, that's interesting. Come and have a chat. <laughs> There's not a person in the world who doesn't want to hear every single detail about that. <laughs> Otherwise, shh. Because I don't care what you say, Richard. Because motherly love is the most impressive love in the universe. It really isn't. I think motherly love is actually less impressive than fatherly love. Because <laughs> Some dads do fuck off. So if you hang around, guys, well done. One point, that's all you're getting, but... Your mum would have loved whatever crawled out of her the day you were born. Anything could have come out there, mate, instead of you. She'd have loved it exactly the same. Could have been a bunch of flowers. Could have been a butterscotch change your delight. Could have been, um... But it could have been a blankety blank checkbook and pen. You know that? Could have been, um... Could have been a... Uh, could have been a Rubik's snake. That, that guy remembers, don't you? You remember the old... Remember the Rubik's snake they make, the Rubik's. <laughs> You'll remember the Rubik's Cube, right? That's a very popular toy. I was, I was, I'm not going for that, that's too obvious. I'm not going to pick that, that's too, everyone remembers that. Um, well, they did really well. Um, then they said, why oh, can we make some more money out of the Rubik's franchise? So they went actually thinking about the, the next step. They um, just cut the corners off and they made a, 
Rubik's Hexagon, that was the next movie. You remember, don't you? Remember? That guy's loving this. It's, um, it's, it's, he remembers it all. Um, then that it didn't do as well. It was the same toy, and it just didn't have the corners on. And, um, <laughs> then someone went, oh, why don't we... Um, we could not do geometrical shapes this time. Why don't we do... It's a Rubik's puzzle, but it's, um, it's, it's a, a snake. <laughs> so we, we make it like a snake. That would work somehow. It would be a snake shape. We could call it the Rubik's snake. <laughs> that guy remembers. So I don't know what lo he's, loving, he's loving this. I'm trying to get into that sort of Peter Kay nostalgia comedy. I'm, I'm, I'm 50 now. I've got two kids. I've got to start making a bit of proper money. I've got to be playing in the big room three times like Stuart Lee. Not this room. <laughs> Half full. I'm trying to make some money. But my unique twist on the format is the stuff that I'm remembering from the past is coming out your mother's cunt. That's the difference. Do you, do, you, do you remember Spangles, mate? Do you remember them? Coming out your mother's cunt, weren't they? Plop, plop, plop. Do you remember? All the different flavours, weren't they? I think one of this sort of overriding taste of your mother's vaginal canal, didn't they? What, what was that all about? You still ate them, though, didn't you? Not sure it's as commercially viable as PK stuff. We'll see, we'll see how... Yeah, see which room I'm playing next year. <laughs> I did a routine a bit like that on the last tour. The reason I'm doing it again uh, is because I did a gig in a place called Fairham, lovely little art centre in Hampshire. I thought it had gone really well, OK? I was back home the next morning eating my breakfast, basking in the glow of being a comedy genius, as I do most mornings. I don't need to tell you. Don't laugh at that. It's not, it's, that wasn't a joke. Uh, and an email pinged into my phone. It was from someone who'd been at the show. I want to share it with you. Uh, now, here it is. Uh, it starts, uh, Hi, Richard. Nice, friendly start, isn't it? That's, I'm looking forward to reading this email. As I assume from that start, it will be positive. Let's see. I haven't read it before. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I just wanted to take the opportunity to say that I was embarrassed for you at last night's show. <laughs> you simply aren't funny. <laughs> Your jokes are pure art. Now, what he's done quite, is quite clever. He's put jokes in inverted commas. So, uh, what he's saying there is the things that I imagine are jokes are not jokes, they're jokes. He satirised me there with punctuation. That is not only very clever, he is also the first person to ever think of doing that. So that is... <laughs> very impressive. And your observational comedy, not my observational comedy, my observational comedy. <laughs> so in this case, he's accepting what I'm doing is comedy. <laughs> what he's disputing, however, is his observational nature. He's... He's saying I'm imagining it's based on some kind of observation, but it isn't. It's based on no observation whatsoever, which is actually quite impressive if you think about it, isn't it? All comedy begins from some basic observation. Even the most surreal flight of fantasy has to begin in the real world. If I've created observational comedy, I've actually created a whole new format of comedy. That is... I'm taking that as a compliment. Anyway, um, my observational comedy is cringy and forced. Well, of course it is, mate. It's the first time I've ever tried it. Give me a chance. It's difficult. Devil, can you try coming up with jokes based on no observation? People don't like it. They like, they like it. It's like that George Clooney lip thing. It has to be true, or people don't find it funny. That's the problem. It's no surprise I left at the interval. It's the biggest waste of fifteen pounds times two I've ever made. <laughs> Is it just me? Is that an odd way to express that? Is it? <laughs> is it the biggest waste of thirty pounds he's ever made, or is it specifically the biggest waste of fifteen pounds times two he's ever made? Because those are two very different things. A lot of things cost thirty pounds. If I'm the biggest waste of thirty pounds, that is incredibly insulting. Hardly anything costs fifteen pounds times two, though, does it? That is. That's, that sounds to me like he's gone to the box office and said, "Please may I have one ticket to see Richard Terry? Here's twenty pounds. I'd like my five pounds change." Oh, no, I haven't finished. What would make you think that? Um, please, may I have a ticket to see Richard Herring? Yes, I know I have one. I would like another one in a separate transaction. Here's my £20. I'd like my £5 chain. I've done it like that just in case I don't enjoy the show so that I can then honestly say it is the biggest waste of £15 times two. I have it. There is a possibility you can't multiply 15 by two, which... which would explain why he didn't like my show, because my stuff's pretty cerebral. You have to be quite brainy to get this. Being able to multiply 15 by 2, that's entry level. If you can't do that, you're getting very little out of this show. That is, that's how clever this stuff is. 
Just to be clear, if your kids don't love you unconditionally, then that's your fault for being a shit dad. <laughs> They'll grow up being embarrassed of you because you act like you're 29, when in fact, you're old enough to be their granddad. No, I mean, that's not... I mean, that's... It's, that's it, it's just, it's just true, isn't it? It's, tr it's true, that's not, that's not a joke, that's just tr that's not nice. That's a bit of a truth bomb. With a Richie Herring to deal with there, that is... Take a little bit of getting over that. I think you need to grow up and stop pretending you've just left university because basically you're a nearly 50-year-old guy unable to accept his age. I mean, that's just my act, though, isn't it? That, that, is just, that is just a description of what I do on stage. That is not an insult. That could have been my entry in the Edinburgh Fringe programme. That, I asked him to put that quote on the back of my leaflet because I thought that perfectly sums up what I'm attempting to do on stage. That's like going to Charlie Chaplin. Well, you're just a bloke falling over and pretending you don't have a house. Yes! Yes, I am! It's difficult to describe your own comedy. This guy could help out a lot of people. Good luck with the rest of the tour. <laughs> don't think he meant that, did he? He's being sarcastic. He's saying I'm going to need good luck because I'm shit, but he confused me because he didn't put good luck in inverted commas. That is this. If you've got a sarcasm system, you have to stick with it. You can't just change it halfway through. It's too confusing. That's John. That's John in Ferrum. Now, look, I don't go around thinking everyone thinks I'm hilarious, OK? I'm surprised if anyone finds me funny, to be honest. I know I'm not everyone's taste. There'll be a couple of people in the room here tonight who've taken a chance on me, don't know who I am, having the worst night of their life. And I'm, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry that's happened, but that's just the way life is. You take a chance, it doesn't work out, you move. You move on, don't you? You don't have to tell me what you think about this yourself because comedy is the most assessed job on this planet, right? Every single second of my working day is assessed by you via your group laughter. I know exactly how every single second of every show is going. Tonight, I, mean, I wish we hadn't done the DVD just tonight, but it's, no, it's, going, it's, going, it's going fine. It's room for improvement. I'm going to fight through. It'll be fine. You don't need to email me with your individual opinions because I've got it. I've got, the I've got the whole focus group here, right? So your, your individual opinion matters to you. It doesn't matter to me, okay? So tell your friends. That's fine. Tell your friends if you like the show. Please tell your friends if you didn't like the show because they're probably cunts as well. So I don't, I don't want them coming. Spoiling it for everyone else. Don't email me, I don't, that doesn't matter, I don't really care what you think. Comedy is not only the most assessed job on the planet, it's self-policing. Because if I'm not funny, then what happens is nobody will pay to come and see me. I'll have no cash, me and my family will starve to death. So, if you see the emaciated corpse of my six-month-old son in the gutter, then you can go, yes, 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 I told you Richard Herring wasn't funny. Justin, in your face, you dead baby. How'd you like that? Are you enjoying it? How'd you like it? At least have the decency to call him by his name. He's Ernie. Find out his name if you're going to do that. <laughs> but, you know, if you think about it, that email arrived at nine o'clock in the morning. That meant that guy had stormed out of the gig 12 hours previously, gone home in a fury, slept on it. <laughs> Woken up, probably forgotten for a couple of seconds, then remembered, ah! <laughs> Still sent me that horrible email. That's how cross I'd made him. I didn't sleep on it. I emailed him back straight away. Uh, here's... <laughs> Here was my response. Ha ha, oh dear, you idiot. <laughs> I deleted the you idiot, but I think it's implicit in the rest of the email. Sorry you didn't enjoy the show. Humour is subjective as the hundred plus other people enjoying the comedy proves. I'm not for everybody and it's a shame you wasted your money. I'm happy to send you a check if you give me your address. That was a genuine offer. I, he never emailed back so I wasn't able to refund him. But, um, to be honest, to be fair, I was going to send him a check for 15 pounds times two. So it's... <laughs> I'm not sure you can cash those. <laughs> The character I play on stage is of someone who's nearly 50 and unable to accept his age. You're meant to be laughing at him, not getting hurt by the stupid things he says. Only someone insecure about their own relationship with their children could be upset with something that is so clearly ridiculous. <laughs> Just true. Come on, he gave me a little truth bomb, didn't he? Time for a little truth hand grenade back to John there. You could only be upset with something as stupid as saying kids are incapable of love 
if your children hate you, can't you? That's the only way it's getting under your skin. Having read his email, I can understand why they do. <laughs> I'm thinking that second ticket might have been for a child who didn't show up. <laughs> when I see something I don't like, I move on and learn from the experience. I don't bother emailing the person involved to blame them for not fitting in with my subjective opinion. Looks like I'm not the only childish one. Good luck with your anger issues. <laughs> Didn't mean it, I was just using his own format against him. Good luck, he's gonna need good luck. I am, after all, just playing a character which I leave on stage. <laughs> not true, that last bit. It's not true, they say, it's not. Um, this is very much exactly how I am on stage and off. If anything, I've dialed it down a little bit to make myself a bit more believable and likable. But it's uh, <laughs> thanks to John for emailing in. That's 10 minutes of the show I wouldn't have had if he hadn't got in touch. Uh, I didn't have to pay him for writing that. In fact, he paid me 15 pounds times two for the privilege. <laughs> 45 pounds he paid me, mate. <laughs> That's why you're not enjoying the show. It's too clever, mate. It's just shh, shh, everything. Shh. You know, it's interesting, he, he calls me child, he sees being child as this pejorative thing. I think having got to 50, still doing this for my living, not having had to get a proper job, uh, it's a triumph, I'm afraid. I'm not going to feel bad about this. I'm hoping this will go on forever. I hope I never have to grow up. And being childish is looked as being this negative thing, but there's so many positive things about being childlike that most of us lose. We'd be better off if we kept them. I look at my three-year-old daughter. Her sense of wonder about absolutely everything in the world. She has to stop every few steps just to look at the tiniest details. She sees magic everywhere in the world. She wants to jump in every puddle she sees. She has to experience everything. She finds everything funny, including herself. The other night, she just had a bath. She was in her bedroom, completely naked. We were playing the Beatles, All You Need Is Love, on the, I, I, the iPod. And um, she just started doing this amazing interpretive, naked interpretive dance to this. Just dance around, no self-consciousness, just enjoying herself. It was beautiful. She did break dancing in the middle of it. I'm not sure that's what the Beatles intended. <laughs> just singing along with it. It was magical. I started singing along with her too. She said, no, Daddy, just me. It's... <laughs> I'm sure that was the, in the context of the original song. But it's, <laughs> children are incapable of love, it just proves it. But it's, <laughs> this guy is childish like my six month old baby. You know, the whole universe has to revolve around him and only him. Oh, something's happening, I don't like what's going on. I went to the theater and it wasn't directed exactly at my taste. Oh, they're throwing my toys out the pram. The world's run by these baby men at the moment. We let it happen. One of them's the President of the United States. That is. Have the audacity to call anyone else childish is pathetic. And of course, having kids is great if you want to stay childlike because you get to play with their toys. No one told me about that. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. But then I became a man and I put away childish things. But as I was putting them away, I thought, hold on, some of these childish things are pretty good. There's, there's kaplunk in here, there's, there's hungry hippos. Remember hungry hippos, mate? Coming out your mother's cunt, weren't they? Do you remember? <laughs> you must remember. <laughs> they seem to have lost their appetite a bit, haven't they, once they're up there? They never, they never played quite as voraciously again, did they, after that? I wonder what happened to them up there. This is one of my daughter's toys. Uh, it's, it's by no means uh, her favourite. I like it a lot more than she does. Some of you may uh, recognise it. It's called Penguin Race. Uh, though that's a misnomer. This is a single track game. There is no overtaking possible in this. This is at best a penguin parade. Okay, what, what happens? You flick a little switch. It makes an awful noise. The lights flash then. Wee! 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 I cannot get enough of this game. So it's like a... I could watch this for hours. My daughter turns off after two spins, starts playing with the penguins individually. I go, no, put it back on, play with it properly, you're doing it wrong. I've had to buy my own one, this is mine. She won't, <laughs> she won't play with hers properly, it's just... I genuinely thought about making my whole tour show, just me coming on stage, turning this on, not saying a word, we just watch it for 45 minutes. Have an interval, come back 45 minutes, go home. That's, I think some of you from the reaction I'm getting now would have enjoyed that. <laughs> 
You seem to be loving, loving this. Some people on Amazon go, no, I, I had to disconnect the speakers. It was so annoying. I've hidden in the attic. It's horrible. What are you talking about? That's the beauty of the noise, the fury, the lights, just the colours. It's inside. I mean, what the fuck is it meant to be? Where, how did they even come up with this idea? It's like nothing on earth. And this, this, this is just your life, isn't it? That's your life. Summed up in penguin form. You're the penguin in the back, mate. You're never going to win this race. It's just trudge, 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 trudge. Whee! Oh, trudge, 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 trudge. Whee! Over and over again, round and round, never ending. You're thinking there must be some reason this is happening. Some higher purpose for us doing this. Some God looking down. He's created this in order to judge us. If we do it in the right way, we'll be rewarded in heaven. No! You just go round and round in a circle for no discernible reason, over and over again, until the batteries run out and you're dead. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going to turn this off now, but if you're a good audience, I might let you play with that again later. That is it's a little trick I learned from parenting this. <laughs> what I like about this game, on the box it's called Penguin Race. On the actual game it's got a different name. It's, it's called Running Go, which is a strange name for this, right? Because uh, the penguins are on wheels, they're just sliding and climbing. There's no opportunity to run in this game at all. Uh, and you might have noticed if you're in the front, it's, it's actually spelled R-U-N-I-N-G. So it's... It's actually Runingo, which has uh, some kind of Celtic influence in there. Which is quite an embarrassing mistake to make on a children's story. It's made in China, this game, right? But it's been going for 50 years. You think at some point in the last five decades, someone might have rang them up and go, oh, so, uh, sorry, mate, you've made a bit of an embarrassing error on the packaging of the UK version of your game. You've misspelled quite a basic English word. I mean, it's for kids. It's broadly speaking educational. Maybe on the next print run you correct that. No, mate, fuck off. Fuck it. <laughs> We're getting £6.99 a pop off of these things. I'm not wasting 50 quid on getting a graphic designer in there. Leave it. They're only five. They can't fucking read anyway. Can they? <laughs> it is a confusing game to understand what's going on. Luckily, they've, they do explain what it is on the site, right? And I'll have to read this for you. It's written down here. Perfectly explains why this game even exists, why it came about. What it says here is, the small penguin of a group of likability. That's, <laughs> that's what that is there. It's the small penguin of a group of likability, that's the... The small penguin of a group of likability is... There are three penguins in this game. They're all identical in size, and none of them are likable. They're all little pricks, if I'm honest with you. So, don't understand where that's come from. <laughs> I mean, it's made in China again, maybe. They've gone, oh, should we get an English... None of us speak English. Should we, should we get an English person in to help us translate the UK packaging of this game? No, don't be stupid, I'm wasting money on that. Chinese and English are basically the same language. They, all we need is a Chinese-English dictionary. We'll work out what I want to say from that. So what I'll say is something like a small group of likeable penguins, small penguin of a group of likability. That's how you say that in English. No, no, don't run it past them. I don't care if you've got an English friend who'll do it for nothing. Write down this, write down, write down, just write it now. Never change it. Just never change arrogant. Uh, the guy on the other side, He's got this down to three words. Now, you might not think that's possible to describe this game in three words, but when you hear those three words, your life is going to turn... One of the words is the. That's how arrogant <laughs> this guy is. On the other side, what it says here is the comedy contest. <laughs> the comedy contest. C-O-M-I-T-Y. <laughs> the comedy contest. This guy, he's gone... No, I don't speak English, but... I don't need the dictionary. I, um, I'm pretty certain there's a common English phrase, the comedy contest. I, uh, I think I heard Michael Knight say it on Knight Rider the other week. It was actually about a situation almost identical to this as well. So it's, don't just write it on. You wrote the other guy. Write it on, just write it on. Don't, 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 just write it on. I'm sure. What's he trying to say? The comedy contest, do you think? The community contest? The vomity contest? I've, I've been taking the piss out of this Chinese guy for quite a while. I thought I'd better just get a dictionary and check comedy isn't a word. And I know you've all been laughing at me, haven't you? Because you know comedy's a word, isn't it? Comedy, if you look up in the dictionary, is the informal and voluntary recognition by courts of one jurisdiction of the laws and judicial decisions of another. <laughs> the comedy contest. There is a comedy. <laughs> the comedy contest.
But, um, you know, having kids, it really changes the relationship with your partner, doesn't it? Because you start out as a romantic couple. You're, like, hanging out with each other, maybe making love with each other. You do that for a few years, and you go, well, like, let's forget about all that. Um, why don't we go into business with each other, OK? We're going to have a... We're going to have a brand new job, which is going to be to raise a human being from an egg. Okay, it's going to take about 20 years to do this. Uh, it's 24-7. Uh, there's uh, 365 days a year. You don't get Christmas off. You have to work a bit harder on Christmas, if I'm honest. Um, we're not going to get paid for this job either. We're going to have to pay thousands of pounds a year for the privilege of doing it, which means we have to carry on doing our regular jobs, even though we'll be too tired to do anything. So that's... When it's all over, that kid, 20 years has passed, that kid's going to turn around and tell us both to fuck off because we're cunts. Fancy giving that a go? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds better than having sex and going to the cinema, doesn't it? Let's, let's do that. <laughs> and, you know, it's so hard. You're so tired. I, I think all couples go through this. You start bickering. Sometimes me and my wife have had real proper full-on arguments like we never would because we're so tired. It's just so... If you can get through having kids, then your love is absolutely pure and fantastic and that's... Uh, it's, it's, it's such a difficult thing to do and you take everything in shifts, right? Because you're just trying to give each other some rest so you hardly see each other for a start. But, and I'm trying to play my part. I work at night, but I try to do the early morning shifts as much as I can. If I'm doing that, I'll do what a lot of parents do. I'll sit my daughter down in front of CBeebies, you know, and just like re to the world together and then my wife will take over and I won't speak to her. And so the, the adults on the CBeebies channel are often the only grown-ups I interact with in a day. And they're... They're so charming and friendly and outgoing, aren't they? You start to think they're genuinely your mates, aren't they? <laughs> Not Andy from Andy's Dinosaur Adventures. That cunt can fuck right off. That is, <laughs> that is the biggest misuse of time travel there has ever been. Oh, what, have you broken a dinosaur egg in your museum, mate? Don't go back to Jurassic times to pick up a fresh one. Why don't you go back 15 minutes and tell yourself stop being such a clumsy prick? <laughs> Maybe get a job more suited to your talents. I found myself getting very attached to one of the presenters on CBBS, which is the presenter called Rebecca. Um, oh, I could tell there was a slight sound of stiffening of trouser fabric there. I, I think some of, the, some of the dads know who I'm talking about. She's a very attractive young woman. She's uh, got a brunette, very slim, very sexy Welsh lady. She's very good looking, but what I like about her is she's not afraid to goof around. She'll make herself look stupid as long as that makes you laugh. She looks like she'd be a lot of fun to hang around with, doesn't she, dads? Um, <laughs> She's in a programme called Let's Play. <laughs> she knows what she's doing. She's not stupid. She knows what she's... She knows she's going, oh, come on, Dad, let's play. She knows what she's... She's doing it on purpose. She... In that show, every week, she dresses up in a different costume. Oh, Dad, look what I'm wearing this week. Oh, let's play. Oh, let's... She knows. She knows what she's doing. I realised my relationship with Rebecca from Let's Play was getting a bit out of hand when I found myself watching an episode of Let's Play on BBC iPlayer on my own. Um, <laughs> it's the one where she's playing tennis and I cannot recommend it enough, fellas. It's, uh, it's, I noticed it in the opening titles, but it was never coming up in terrestrial broadcast, so I Googled it to try and find it for myself. That, uh, that whole bit is um, just a crazy joke, obviously. That is that, none of that... Uh, clearly none of that happened. Uh, it's just a crazy thing I made up. So I, um, I thought for the sake of my wife, uh, I should leave Rebecca from uh, Let's Play Behind. I became obsessed with someone I thought was a bit safer on the CBeebies channel, which was Fenella from the Furchester Hotel. Now, oh, hey, how am I going to describe this to people who, who don't have kids? Um, oh, it's basically the Muppets. You all remember the Muppets coming out of your mother's cunt. And they've... <laughs> They've set up a hotel together. It's a bit like Faulty Towers. And I suppose Fenella, maybe they're going for Prunella scales. They're trying to do a little tribute to Sybil. But she's not like Sybil, because she's not mean and nasty. She's very friendly. She's outgoing. She's trying to help everyone solve everyone's problems. She's got this big shock of red hair. She wears this kind of sexy feather bow, a big red lip. She looks like she's up for it, I have to say. She's... <laughs> she's like a middle-aged Muppet, man. I've gone for a Muppet in my own age range. I haven't picked... I've gone for Elmo, one of the kid ones like you would. I've gone for a... <laughs> you and Paul Hollywood. I've gone for a, I've gone for an age... I've gone for an age-appropriate Muppet in my own age range. I really would like to have sex with Fenella from the Fur Chest Hotel. I'm not ashamed of that. I don't, I don't see why I should be ashamed of that. I'm, I would like to have sex with Fenella from the Fur Chest Hotel. 
I told my wife about my obsession with Fenella from the Furchester Hotel. I didn't tell her about, from, about Rebecca from Let's Play. Uh, and if you know my wife, please don't tell her about that. That's the end of my marriage if she finds out. But um, she found it quite funny that I wanted to fuck a puppet. She said she didn't mind me doing that. She, she said I could add Fenella to my celebrity shag list. Celebrities, you're allowed to shag if the opportunity comes up. Um, on the condition, she said, that I had to also persuade the voiceover artist and the puppeteer to come to bed at the same time to make the whole experience authentic. As if I wasn't going to do that anyway. I mean, I don't, I don't want to have sex with some limp Muppet. I'm not sick. I, don't wanna, I want them moving around and talking. That's the whole point, isn't it? I don't want to... Oh, fuck me, Richard. Fuck me. That's what I want. I don't want to... I don't want to fuck a dead Muppet like you and Paul Hollywood, mate. I want to have it... Basically, my wife thought I couldn't have sex with Fenella from the Furchester Hotel, that's what she was saying. But I can, I can fuck a puppet if I want to. I can, I can fuck a Muppet. I was going to show them. I wrote an article about my obsession with Fenella from the Furchester Hotel in the Metro when I used to have that column. Within five hours of that article being published, I got an email from the producers of the Furchester Hotel <laughs> saying, we're delighted you like our show. <laughs> Would you like to come up to Manchester, visit the Furchester Hotel, and meet all the puppets? <laughs> with your family. <laughs> Which I thought was sending out a bit of a mixed message, if I'm honest. Like, oh, I read in the paper you wanna, you wanna fuck one of our puppets. Come up to Salford, mate, come along, fuck away with our compliments, fill your boots, but do bring your children along so they can be as mentally scarred by this experience as everyone else involved. You You'd think after all the BBC have been through recently, they'd be a bit more cautious about... Oh, there's a bloke in the paper who says he wants to fuck one of our puppets. Shall we ring Operation U-Tree, get his photo in reception, make sure he doesn't get within 50 yards of the bill? What are you talking about? Get him up here! He's the fan of the show! Let him come up! Let him fuck a couple of them! What's the problem? They're just bits of cloth. That's the beauty of having sex with a puppet. You can use it to wipe up with afterwards. That's the... That's the disgusting part of that routine, is it? That's interesting. <laughs> so I found myself in a car driving from London, where I was living at the time, to Manchester with my wife and my daughter to visit the Furchester Hotel. Now, my daughter does not particularly like the television programme, the Furchester Hotel. I would say she actively dislikes the programme. My wife hasn't really seen it. It's been on in the background when she's been in the room. I'm only watching it as pornography. So it's... <laughs> It was a strange experience. The producers were all again excited. Oh, what? We're so happy you like the show. What's your favourite episode? I said, I don't know, mate. I'm just watching it for the furry tits. I don't know. <laughs> Look at the plots. My wife said, the one with the hats. I don't know where she got that from. There is one with hats in it. She pulled it out of the bag for us. So we were allowed down on the studio for all these gigantic puppets. I mean, my daughter terrified. Generally the worst day of her life so far. <laughs> I was having a nice time. And all the puppeteers, the crew, everyone was so welcoming. I love the puppeteers especially. They were crazy, sort of mad sense of humour, but in a brilliant way. And Louise, who does the Vanilla puppet, she was so excited about all this. She said, I can't believe you fancy Vanilla. This is so flattering. She was saying to my wife, I hope it's not awkward for you that your husband is so obsessed <laughs> with Vanilla. She was taking it really seriously. I mean, I thought this had obviously been a joke. I was thinking, fuck. I'm going to have to go through with this. This is... <laughs> the whole lot of them were gathering around. They all wanted a bit of me. That's not what... I would have sex with Vanilla. I didn't want a, some massive puppet gangbang orgy. I didn't want Fergus joining, watching me as I bang his wife with his stupid scotch face, leering at me. I'm not into that. So we had a photo taken, me and my wife and my daughter, with the main puppets, and uh, Louise made Fenella nibble my ear as that photo was being taken. I'm not joking. It was the most erotic thing that has happened to me, no offence to my wife, in 15 years. I, I can now only make love to my wife if she's dressed up as a Muppet. It's, it's, I usually choose Beaker, because um, I've always liked him. There's something a bit mysterious about him, and there's something... And the thing is, my wife looks quite like him anyway. That's this... There's barely any dressing up involved at all. It's sort of slightly embarrassed. Her voice is identical. <laughs> I'm starting to think, you know, do I like Beaker because of my wife or did I like my wife because of Beaker? I mean, it's not a question I really want to come up with an answer for. That is 
It's a very dangerous question to ask. She's in tonight. So, uh, it's, um... <laughs> I'm enjoying the show so far. Uh, if you're enjoying it, uh, we'll come back in 20 minutes uh, for some more. If you're not enjoying it, this is an excellent time to storm out furiously, wait 12 hours, and then email me. Uh, but uh, <laughs> if you are enjoying it, go and have a drink in a week, and I'll see you in about 20 minutes. Thank you so much for coming. Please welcome back Richard Herring! Thank you very much. Lovely to be here, thank you. Lovely to be back. Not working for you? Lied to me, Jack Black, lied to me again. Uh, hope you had a nice interval. I hear there's been some uh, comedy incidents up the stairs. Some of you got some beer thrown over you, is that right? Some tripped over and threw beer over you? No? Okay, maybe it's a different audience. <laughs> well, anyway, welcome back to the show. Hey, there's a lot of good things about being an older dad, right? Um, it's not all bad. If you've got food spilled down you, you can go, yeah, that was the baby. <laughs> That's it, actually, but it's... It's weird having a boy after having got used to having a girl, right? Because boys and girls are very different. I don't know if any other comedians have covered this, let's see. Um, <laughs> especially when it comes to changing nappies. You get used to one terrain, and then there's a different landscape that you're working with. And the other morning, I found myself gently cleaning my son's testicles with a wet wipe. And we caught each other's eye, and... It was just this quite magical moment. He knew instinctively I had something important in my hands. I knew this was very precious, I had to be gentle. And even though, however cross you are, however angry you are, when you go, when you're cleaning uh, someone else's testicles with a wet wipe, it's impossible to remain angry. It all falls out of you. It's a beautiful, it's almost spiritual moment because I've never cleaned another man's testicles with a wet wipe before. I'm, that makes it sound like I've cleaned them with a different cloth. I've never cleaned a man's testicles with any cloth, especially a dirty flannel. <laughs> and is it, there's something weird about it, something magical, something just it, it takes everything away from you. It's, um, be, I believe every morning should start with a lottery where every man has to go out and clean the testicles of a, a random man in the area. It, it, it's not going to be any travel, it'll be somewhere, in, somewhere around where you live. Uh, and Because however angry you are when you go, when you've got his testicles in your hands and you're cleaning them, you'll catch his eye. Even if you know him and don't like him, he knows you've got something important, you know you've got something important. You have to be careful because in the lottery you might come up tomorrow and he's doing yours, so... <laughs> There'll be no more violence in this world if that's how we started this. Someone will come around and do yours later, so it's brilliant. It'll, there'll be no more dirty testicles, which, according to a lot of my teabagging fan friends, is not the case at the moment. <laughs> but, you know, I would just... The, I would just... The, my only worry about being an older dad is that I die before my kids grow up, and I just want to see them grow up. I'd see that, this thing through and see who they become. And there's so many ways you could... I'm not that fit, but there's so many ways nowadays. I've been living here in London until recently, and I don't need to tell you how terrifying this city can be. Um, and I was very moved, as I'm sure all of you were, by the terrible attacks on this city last year, uh, especially the London Bridge attack, which is a place I know so well. Uh, it felt like my home was being attacked. I was so furious about what had happened, but also impressed and amazed by the bravery of the people who were caught up in that situation, running towards those guys. They thought they had bombs. They knew they were killing people, running at them with just their fists and Glasses, incredible bravery. I was thinking, would I be as bold as that if I was unlucky enough to be caught up in that situation? I just don't think I would. If, they, I, if I was ever unlucky enough to be in a situation where someone ran up to me, attacked me, and said, this is for Alan, all I could do would be to say, who's Alan? Because <laughs> the kind of guys who do those attacks, that's really going to get under their skin, is it? And they're not. They're not going to be able to walk away from that. That's what I'm saying. They'll be going, no, no, Alan, mate, Alan. Mate, I don't know anyone called Alan. Certainly you'd do something like this. I mean, 
was it Alan Supple? I was at university with him. We shared a flat. We were, it was 30 years ago. We were good friends. Why is he... Why is he waiting all this time to send you guys to get... Alan, man. Alan, I don't you die on me. I'm not letting you die. And do you know why you're dying? You're dying for Alan. Alan. I wish I'm the authorities turn up. Take him out. I'm a hero, aren't I? That's the way I... <laughs> Wait, I look at it, suicide comedy. <laughs> Something I'm used to doing, don't worry, it's fine. I'm prepared to make those sacrifices. But being childish isn't always a positive thing, like in that example. <laughs> I was, uh, a couple of years ago, I went skiing with my wife. Now, I'd never been skiing before. I had no desire to go skiing. I knew I would hate skiing. I knew I'd be terrible at skiing. I was right on every level. I don't know if you've been... Uh, what they do, first of all, they make you put on these massive boots that are so unbearably tight. Every single step you make for the rest of the day, every movement is utter agony. It's like being tortured on a rack. Then you have to walk from the ski shop to the mountain half a mile with your skis over your shoulders. And, ah, ah, you're like, you're like Christ on the road to Calvary. <laughs> Except you're actually quite looking forward to getting crucified because it might take the weight off your feet. <laughs> Then when you get there, you're expected to slide down an icy slope like that, just on some sticks. You could fall over, crack your head open and die. You could slip off a cliff and die, fall off a chairlift, freeze to death, fall into a snowdrift and, and, and suffocate. Uh, you, the best thing you can hope for is just fall over and break an arm. That's a good day on the ski slopes. Oh, do you know what I mean? You get through just one broken limb. You're the best skier there's ever been. Well done, mate. That is... You can't do it, you're bruised. Three-year-old kids that go between your legs, they would do it perfectly. It's emasculating. The only good thing about going skiing is when you get to the end of the day and you're finally allowed to take the boots off. That is, oh, oh my God, it's so wonderful not to be in agony all the time. It's just like, like bliss. I just can't believe how wonderful. I didn't realise how lucky my life was at nine o'clock this morning until I put these boots on. I will never complain about anything again. Just don't let me go skiing. That can't be the reason everyone goes, right? Just for the <laughs> philosophical realisation their life is okay already by adding something worse to it. That can't be. Maybe it is. Uh, we were in Austria. We went for three days. On the third day, I said to my wife, I hate this. I don't want to go back up that mountain. She said, fair enough, you've given it a go. Let's go to the spa. The hotel had this posh spa. My wife wanted to go in the sauna. Now, I don't understand saunas either. Right? You get into a tiny wooden box that's unbearably hot and it's impossible to breathe. That's just being buried alive. That is not a leisure activity. The only good thing about going in the sauna is coming out of the sauna and going, oh my God, I'm not dead. Thank you, Jesus. I'll never be rude about you again. Thank you for saving my life. I just want to go on holiday where I'm room temperature. Is that, is that too much? Is that too much to us? So my wife wanted to look around the spa. She said, I'll meet you in the sauna. I went in the sauna. I was wearing my swimming trunks. Is that what you do in the, in the sauna, mate? Swimming trunks? Yeah. yeah. You and me, we're normal guys. That's why. I knew we'd connect on that. That's why. I was lying there, minding my own business. The door opened. I assumed it was going to be my wife, but it wasn't. It was a 55-year-old European, middle-aged European lady. I've got quite, because of my job, I've got quite sharp skills of observation. And <laughs> the thing I noticed about almost immediately was she was bare-ass naked, okay? She wasn't wearing a stitch. She just, no swimming costume, no towel, nothing. She just waltzed in as if being naked was the most natural thing in the world. <laughs> Then she lay down on the bench opposite me with her bottom bit smiling up at me like a flesh-coloured end-to-end double rainbow. <laughs> I didn't know where not to look, I have to say. I, I got red and had steam come out of my ears had I not been in a sauna, so that was happening already. Then, then the door opened, my wife walked in, and then, Christ, what's she going to say? She's only gone two minutes. I'm here with a naked European, but... She clearly recognised this as something sophisticated and continental. She wanted to appear sophisticated as well, so she sat down without saying a word. But there is nothing sophisticated about not snooping like a schoolchild when presented with an unexpected noo-noo. <laughs> you could see a chuff, mate. The whole, ev the whole lot, everything. I'm guessing. I wasn't staring at it, but it was... It was difficult to avoid everywhere I looked. It was following you around the room. It was like the eye of Sauron. Wow, wow. I don't, I'm 48 at the time. I, I should be able to take a stranger's tuppence in my stride, but I'm embarrassed enough by my own rattle genitalia. I wouldn't voice this on you, madam. If I, 
If I wanted to show you my penis and or testicles, I would say, would you care to see either or both parts of my genitalia? And if you said, I would love that, Richard, then I would make you sign a form in triplicate saying you'd agree. You've got to be careful these days, fellas. <laughs> And then, after that, voila! What a bounteous feast would be on display for your delight. That is a genuine offer. I'm, in the, I'm just up there after the show in the, in the bar. But I was so embarrassed, I had to leave. I couldn't stand it. I had to leave the sauna. My wife stayed in there. I walked out. It was only when I got out of the sauna, I saw there was a sign on the wall saying it was hotel policy that you had to be naked in the sauna. After all of this, it was me that had committed the social faux pas by hiding my little fetus genitals away. That woman must have been, how rude is this Englishman? What have I done to upset him? Why, why is he not showing me his penis? He, he should be waving around in my face like a helicopter. The English has own rude. It also said on the sign that anyone under 14 wasn't allowed in the sauna. I mean, thank God for that, at least. That means anyone 14 or over was allowed in the sauna. I was mentally scarred by this at 48. Imagine if the 14-year-old me had been in there. The only vagina I'd seen at that point had been in a torn up copy of Fiesta that I'd found in Ship and Woods and that. That had haunted me for the next 15 years. I didn't want to go anywhere near them. I thought they were all full of papier-mâché. I voted Brexit because of this, because we don't want to be a part of that. We're better off without that and we don't want to be part of that disgusting. To be honest, that's no more ridiculous than any of the reasons anyone else voted for Brexit. That's, if you go to the Brexit website, that's all they've got on there now. That's it. We, we, we don't want to see their fannies. That, that's all they've got. Sorry about the economic disaster and the border problems we didn't really think of, but at least we won't see any vaginas. That's good. Should have put that on the side of the bus, shouldn't they, mate? Wow, wow, of... oh, well, No one wants to see that, do they? So, um, we've moved out to, to the countryside now. Um, we've been trying to, we moved out of London, finally got out. We're in Hertfordshire, in a little village in Hertfordshire. It's very nice. And um, we did try to move for a couple of years. I realised how long it had taken when I put www into my browser on my computer. And the first suggested website that popped up was rightmove.com, <laughs> rather than the previous 10 year champion Pornhub. <laughs> when a man is tired of wanking in London, he is tired of life. Oh, it's. <laughs> Don't worry, it's back at number one now, mate. Don't worry. Uh, it's, there's nothing else to do in the countryside. Do it. <laughs> so we needed to buy another car, right? Because we're too far from the station. We need two cars now. If I'm touring, my wife still needs a car for the kids. So I went out and bought a second-hand car to tour in. And I was out in the driveway just trying to familiarise myself with the new controls. You know, it's difficult. I was trying to connect my phone up to the Bluetooth. It wasn't happening. And as I was doing this, there was a little, on the screen, there was a little circle going around saying, searching for Ryan's iPhone. Searching for Ryan's iPhone. I mean, I'm presuming Ryan was the guy who'd owned the car before me. But it just kept on, insisted, searching for Ryan's iPhone. Searching for Ryan's iPhone. I just started feeling really sorry for the car. It didn't, <laughs> didn't know, it didn't know that... Ryan had moved on and they thought, oh, me and Ryan, we've been together for a year, we're best buddies, we're inseparable, it's amazing, I love, oh, he's gone off, he's, where is he? He must have gone on holiday. Oh, it's quite a long holiday. Oh, he's back, he's back. He's put on a bit of weight, hasn't he? Um, oh, he's lost his phone, where's your phone? Where's your phone, Ryan, where's your phone? I was lying in bed that night thinking, is the car still thinking of Ryan even now? It's turned off. Ryan. You've never met someone called Ryan who is a reliable human being, have you? That is, that is the name of a philandra. There's no one called Ryan who's ever been in a successful relationship with anyone or anything. He knew what he was doing. He said, I'm going to buy this car. I'm going to pretend we're exclusive. I'm going to drive it around about 13 months. Then I'm going to fuck off. I'm going to drive any other car I want. I'm not even going to give this car a second thought. I'm going to leave my details in the car so I know the car's still thinking about me, but I will never think about it again. He's horrible. I'm 50 now, I'm responsible. I'm gonna drive that car till I die or it dies or we die together. That is the contract I have made. Still that car would prefer to be with Ryan. I can tell you that for a fact, because I didn't drive the car for a month, I left it at my in-laws. I'd already connected my phone up to the Bluetooth. When I went to pick it up, the phone wasn't connecting. I didn't understand it, it was already in there. I looked at the screen, searching for Ryan's iPhone. That's, that's not possible, right? Either the computer's wiped and it forgets everything or it remembers everything it, there's no in between on that okay that that is a that is a deliberate choice by the car that is conscious decision by the car. but i can understand it we've all got this bluetooth in our brains and our hearts 
that sometimes, I think as we get older, it can connect up to the, to the wrong thing. Because time, as you get older, it starts to lose its meaning. It sort of overlaps on itself. Things from ages ago seem really current. Time's folding over itself. It's like the, like the folds of a brain or a Vionetta. <laughs> on my last time, I was doing a gig in Oxford at a place called the Old Fire Station. And as I was driving there, I thought, hey, I used to go to the Old Fire Station all the time when I was a student. They'd put on gigs there. I sometimes did gigs there. They had this really nice cafe attached where, to it. And I remember, I suddenly remembered this time when I had this amazing jacket potato in that cafe. <laughs> About 1980, I was... It was like it was yesterday. I could still taste it. I could see everything about it. Oh, it's delicious. <laughs> what was that about? Why was I suddenly fixating on that? And I remember the week I had that jacket potato, I'd been in a play, a student play. It had gone quite well. One of my friends came up to me and said, oh, my friend Rachel saw you in that play. She thought you were really funny. She wants to go on a date with you. Now, this never happened to me at university. Women were interested in me. I was bamboozled by this. And this Rachel was drop dead gorgeous okay i couldn't believe this was happening i thought oh my god what am i supposed to do what how am i going to impress her where where should we go i thought i know what we'll do we'll go to the old fire station cafe and have a jacket potato <laughs> that will impress her <laughs> women are not impressed by jacket potatoes fellas no nobody is quite clear about what it is that women want but what all philosophers have agreed is what they definitely don't want is a jacket potato. That's all they've got on their list. You don't even want to watch a fat man eating a jacket potato. That's how bad the jacket potato is. So we had this awful date. She wasn't impressed by the jacket potato. She was definitely not impressed by me. I bumbled around. I blew a definite shag. I never saw her again. It wasn't an important relation in my life. But as I was driving into Oxford, you would not have known that my heart was breaking over this failed relationship. I mean, I think I was regretting blowing this definite thing, but... Why was I obsessing about this girl from 30 years ago? It was insane. In that moment, it felt like it was yesterday. It felt like it was important. It's, it's just crazy. I mean, it might have been the jacket potato, to be fair. It was really good. Um, <laughs> thing is, women come and go, don't they? But never have that jacket potato again. That is, that is gone. <laughs> you can't go back. So I've been doing my family tree, because you have to when you're 50, or they send you to prison. You're trying to find your place in the universe, trying to work out where you came from, where you're going. As you're approaching death, just trying to make things make sense all of a sudden. And the only reason I'd like to be a little bit famous again and be back on TV is so I could do that TV show, Who Do You Think You Are? I, it's brilliant and I just love it so much. I would love to do it. I've accepted it's not going to happen, so I just decided to do it myself. I did Who Do I Think I Am? And... <laughs> I had a bit of help, but I got quite a long way back, two or three hundred years in some cases. But it's not a life-affirming experience to do this, because what happens is you get back a certain point, and then you hit this brick wall. And you know there are people, obviously, behind that brick wall, but you also know you're never going to find out who they were, what, even what their name was. You think, is that it? Two hundred years? Is that all I've got before my entire existence is wiped from the record? That is quite a depressing thing to consider. Luckily, quite a lot of my ancestors had pretty funny names, so that cheered me up. Uh, I've got a whole branch of my family called Pratt. <laughs> Come on. Uh, yeah. I've, got, uh, I've got an ancestor called Andrew Cockburn. Uh, yeah, it's like a penis. I don't know why I'm explaining to you. You're laughing. I'm sorry. Uh, it's, I've got an ancestor called Anne Cumming, C-U-M-I-N-G. I've generally got an ancestor called George Raper, which... <laughs> I mean, that must have raised some eyebrows even in the 1700s, wasn't it? Hello, I'm George Raper. What the fuck is wrong with you, mate? That is disgusting. Why haven't you changed that? I don't see why I should change my name. I'm very proud of it. I come from a long line of rapers. It's presumably the first one. They're handing out surnames. Go, What's your defining characteristic? What would probably sum you up as a person? You are a very prodigious raper, aren't you? You do love raping the raping women, animals, children, dead bodies. It's... Now I've thought of that, I honestly can't think of anything else you do, mate. So that's, no, fair, you've got me there, hands up, that is, I do love a bit of raping, that is fair. I'm happy to go along, I will actually, I'll happily accept that name and call that myself that as well. That is, that's how accurate, I mean, it'll be a little tip off to some of my victims, but it's worth it for the accuracy of the surname. Thanks, mate, that is. I, uh, my favourite ancestor, though, was born in Westmoreland in 1740. He's called Donkin Dover. Come on! How can you not love him? He sounds like a, a nursery rhyme character crossed cross with a donut manufacturer, crossed cross with a pornographer. He's got everything. 
He had 10 kids. I think that might be why they called him Donkin. Um, I genuinely tried to save my wife to call our son Donkin Herring. I thought that'd be nice to hand that baton. Be nice to revive it with Donkin. Hey, Donkin. Donkin! I couldn't take the naming thing seriously. I, I apologise to my wife because every time we had that conversation about both kids, I could only do jokes. I was only, joke names all the way. Uh, with our daughter, the first name I suggested for her was Leanne. But um, <laughs> my wife put it together, unfortunately. Um, I was trying to get like red herring puns in. So with a girl, you could do Ruby or Scarlet. And my wife saw through that. Uh, with my son, I mean, you could do red. It's a bit rude one. Uh, I then went for Rufus, which my wife really loved. It looked like it was going to happen. Then she found out it meant the red-haired one. So it was like Steve McQueen over the first fence. And I, oh, I don't Finally, we went for Ernest, which my wife thinks is a sensible name. But I only chose that so that when he does his first Edinburgh Fringe show, he can call it the Ernest Herringway. Uh, that's, that's my little gift to him. Let's face it, I won't be there to see it. So it's... Then he could have the importance of being Ernest Herring as well. It's two, it's two, two for the price. So I took this family trip back to my folks in Cheddar in Somerset. My mum was really excited because she knew that she had some Irish blood. She suspected that it came through her father's line. And I'd found this whole Irish family that she knew nothing about before. She was ecstatic. I went to bed that night. I was lying in bed on the verge of sleep. I was thinking about the whole family tree thing, swirling around in my mind. And for the first time, it struck me. Why are they called family trees? What's that about? They're not... It's not a family tree, is it? A tree starts from a single trunk, branches grow out of it and twigs. That's not how human beings are. We start from this vast mass of humanity, all fucking and fucking and fucking for millennia, and then you pop out at the end. That's not, that's not a tree, is it? I suddenly realised it should be called a family C, shouldn't it? When you're... When you suddenly have this real clear vision of this family, see, when you're a kid, you're standing on the shore, the waves lap into your feet, the sand beneath your toes, the sun on your back. You turn around, you go, look at all this millennia of copulation that's created me. I'm the end result of all of this. How important am I? You click your fingers, suddenly the water's up to your knees. There's some kids playing in the beach in front of you. You go, well, who are these pricks? What's happening here? I mean, this is still okay, but I'm not sure I like that. You click your fingers, suddenly you're half a mile from shore, the water's up to your neck. You're waving at the people on the beach, they can't see it. I'm over here, I'm drowning. You feel the skeletal hands of your ancestors dragging you under the waves. You suddenly realise this sea isn't made of water. It's made out of the decomposing corpses of all the humans and animals that created you. Some of them are all looming in it, trying to claw at your face. Something you vaguely recognise. Are you Adam coming? I've always wanted to meet you, but most of them are just these skeletal faces with no they wouldn't even remember their own names just looming in at you trying to get you you realize that very soon like them you'll have melted away to nothing be totally forgotten your whole life is a meaningless waste of time <laughs> it was such a clear vision ahead of this i can't tell you it was amazing <laughs> didn't depress me it made me happy I'm glad we're not the end result of anything. I'm glad we're part of this ever going, rolling on process that d eats us up and destroys us. When you're a kid, you think you're the centre of the universe. You think that you're all important. You get older, you realise that's not the case. As a species, the human beings have had to realise this isn't the centre of the universe. Nobody made this. We're an insignificant species on an insignificant planet. We'll be wiped out eventually. Billions and billions of planets and stars, thousands and thousands of universes. We're not important with your life is finite you're here for 70 years and then you're gone it doesn't matter what you do good or bad it'll all be forgotten in 200 years time and that is brilliant it really takes the pressure off it doesn't matter <laughs> nothing you do matters so all that matters is you enjoy yourself while you're here life passes so quickly so make sure you enjoy your moment here in the sunshine because very soon you're going to be floating face down in that sea with Donkin Dover and George Raper he's the last person you want to be face down with <laughs> the best you can hope for 200 years time one of your descendants might just discover your name they'll go hi an answer is called Richard Herring <laughs> what a stupid name idiot <laughs> so 10 years ago the month before I turned 40, I was in a fist fight. I was in a street brawl. It was quite out of character for me at the time. In case you didn't see my show 10 years ago, I'll quickly tell you what happened. I was, at the time, I was doing a show called Menage a Un. Um, 
It's about the fact I was 39 years old and I'd never had a threesome. I, I was quite annoyed about the fact I'd never had a threesome. I thought the best way to make that happen would be to write a show, travel the country to about 60 cities and beg women in the audience to go along with it. <laughs> I thought one in 60 times, statistically speaking, there'll be a couple of slags in the audience <laughs> who'll make that dream come true. It didn't happen, fellas, don't try it. It's not a, it's not a time effective way of doing it. There's a lot of driving. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be too tired, even if it came off. You'd, can I go to bed instead? Just hire some prostitutes. That's um, my best advice. The final gig of the tour was in Liverpool. I deliberately put that in last as a kind of safety net. <laughs> and sure enough, I was in the bar after the show. Three 21-year-old students came up to me and said, we love the show, we're going to the pub. Would you like to come for a drink with us? And I thought, yes, I would like to come for a drink with you. I was a month off turning 40, I was single, I was so depressed. I didn't want to have to go back to another hotel on my own. Touring is so lonely and depressing. Although even if there's just an hour of being in some other people's company, I would love to do it. And something might happen, and there's three of them. So that means technically this would be a foursome. It means technically I won't have had a threesome, which means technically I can still do the not having had a threesome material. This is fine. This is perfect on every level. So we went to the bar, we were having quite a nice time. I was getting on particularly well with one of the girls. Um, then this group of young lads arrived at the bar. It was quite packed, there was nowhere for them to sit. They had to just sit along one side of our table. Didn't look like there'd be any trouble. They didn't look threatening. They were a load of nerds. They looked like math students. It didn't look like anything would kick off. But one of them was slightly cooler and better looking than the others, but only in the way that shit is slightly cooler than diarrhea. Uh, if, you'd, <laughs> if you'd seen him on his own, you'd gone, what an enormous dweeb. I'll stick, stay away from him. But because of the company he kept, comparatively, he looked quite good looking. It's like with you three. Uh, <laughs> on your own, mate, you are... Uh, Fairly hideous human being. I mean, the no, I don't think anyone would... No offence, you've got mirrors, so you know. No one will be sexually interested in you. But because you're sitting next to these two monsters, <laughs> someone, a woman, like I think this woman might have been fooled into thinking you're attractive and have sex with you. It's a great technique. Stick with these two, you're going to be fine. <laughs> you have your role to play, fella, so don't, don't feel bad. Anyway, this slightly cooler guy immediately started chatting up one of the girls I was with because I was quite impressed with that. That takes a lot of balls. That's not something I could ever do. I can't talk to strangers in any circumstance. I just clam up. <laughs> it is true. Uh, so she wasn't really interested in him. He was a little bit drunk and annoying. And the girl as I was with hated him straight away. She saw right through him. He was a bit charming, but she thought he was an idiot. Uh, and then the girl he was with, he gave her his business card, she handed it around to her mates, it got to her, the girl I was with, he started ripping it to pieces and flicking it back in his face, which, a little bit confrontational, but it's only a business card, presumably he had another one. Um, but he lost his shit. He'd been quite charming up to now. He got up, he said, you fucking bitch, you fucking whore. And then he attempted to kick this seated 21-year-old girl in the head. He, he missed, luckily, but I think he'd lost the moral high ground. His friends dragged him out of the pub. They realised he was too drunk. Everyone shell-shocked. I was furious with him. The girl he'd been talking to said, I can't believe he behaved like that. Do you know what he does for a living? He's a university lecturer. He's kicking 21-year-old girls in the head. He can't do that. Can I mean, you'd want to, wouldn't you? The, all those kids sitting in front of you every day, you'd want to kick him in the head. But the first day of lecturer college, they said, we only got one rule. It's basically the lecturer's Hippocratic Oath. You'll want to but you must never kick any of them in the head. That's, that's the only rule. You can do anything else you want, you can fuck them, that's fine. You mustn't kick them in the Anyway, we had a drink. The bar closed about 10 minutes later. We all left together. I thought, where's this going? What's going to happen now? The guy was waiting outside for us. He saw this girl, attempted to punch her. Again, he missed. He was that drunk. Then he saw me. He said, you're a fucking cunt as well, and punched me in the face, which I don't think I'd done anything to deserve. Menage was quite a controversial show. I did set out on tour thinking some, I might get into a physical confrontation with this, but not with someone who hasn't even seen it. That seemed unfair. <laughs> so any other time in my life, I'd walked away, right? He hadn't hurt me. I should have laughed in his face, but I was just approaching 40. I was full of drink. There was hormones flowing around. I was righteously angry with this guy. He did deserve it as well. And I went for him like an animal. It's only when I got to where he was standing that I remembered I don't really have any idea how to fight. Uh, I'm a lover, not a fighter. And uh, I'm a terrible lover, by the way. But I'm, uh, I'm an even worse fighter. But I've seen it on the TV, right? It's just basically that, right? So that's... 
but he was quite tall. I was hard, not really even able to reach his face. So I, I went up for a new tactic, which was to hit him as hard as I could in his testicles. It's a good one if you're that. Uh, he was as bad at fighting as, as me. We're sort of floundering around, really failing to make contact with each other. It was quite a surreal sight, a middle-class comedian and a university lecturer <laughs> brawling on the streets of Liverpool. At one point, I accidentally cracked him in the side of the head really hard. It was brilliant. I, I don't know if you ever hit anyone, mate, but please go out tonight on the South Bank. Just punch some tosser in the South Bank centre. You'll never feel more of a man, I tell you. It was amazing. For weeks. Um, anyway, by the end, he got me in a headlock. He'd ripped my T-shirt right off me. He'd scratched me. That's the kind of fight it was. And... He'd kick me in the testicles. That is unsportsmanlike. You cannot do that. That's against the rules. Um, so he was basically, we were pulled apart by these bouncers. He ran off into the night. The police arrived. They asked me if I'd like to press charges because this guy had attacked me. But they were laughing as they asked that. <laughs> I think the police in Liverpool have seen worse things than a ripped T-shirt. And I was coming down from this. I was embarrassed. I felt mortified by my behaviour. I went, no, no, forget it. I'm just, I'm going, I'm going away. The girls were really apologetic. They felt this was their fault. I mean, it wasn't even... But they were apologising. I said, look, there's a cab here. I'm just going back to the hotel. The girls tried to get into the cab with me. And I said, no, I'm going back on my own. I turned them away. It's the most tragic thing that has ever happened to me. <laughs> the cab driver had seen the whole thing. He turned to me. He said, that was the funniest fight I have ever seen. <laughs> Which wasn't what I've been going for on this occasion. So... But what luck for me, because that was a brilliant story for my new show. It had everything, didn't it? It summed up being 40, it was midlife crisis, the girls, the drink, the fight, and a brilliant punchline, perfect. I thought, nothing's going to happen like that when I'm 50, that will sum up being 50 as well as that. I was wrong. A month before I turned 50, I was in another confrontation, okay? It's pretty much 10 years to the day since the first one. I've been doing this podcast called Richard Haynes Leicester Square Theatre Podcast. Uh, some of the cool kids have started calling it Rahula Stepper. And it's all <laughs> some cool kids in tonight. And, um... Uh, in it, I talk to comedians, and when I dry up, I have this thing called emergency questions. Where I just ask dumb ass questions like, Would you rather have a hand made out of ham or an armpit that dispenses sun cream? It's pathetic, really. Childish. I don't know why any, any, only an idiot would like that. Uh, so, I, um, as a way to raise money for the podcast, like a Kickstarter thing, I, I said I'd do a book of 500 emergency questions that you can uh, ask your friends. Uh, questions like, uh, uh, have you ever been in the vicinity of a Bigfoot, uh, but not seen it, but sentient it watching you? Uh, questions... <laughs> questions like... Um, these are random. Uh, if everyone else in the world left in a spaceship and left you behind so everything belonged to you, where would you live? Wh what paintings would you have on your wall? Would you be lonely? Where would be the most ostentatious place you would masturbate? Uh, <laughs> Questions like, what is the most libelous thing you can say about Prince Andrew? Uh, that's, <laughs> that's difficult because it has to be not true. So, <laughs> think very carefully. So for about 300 people on this Kickstarter thing, as an extra, for a bit of extra money, I said, I'll sign and number your books and I'll write your, your own individual emergency question. I had to write 300 more questions. It was basically like writing a whole other book. It took me weeks. Uh, one of the questions I came up with in that was, have you ever irked a postman? Never had. Don't know where that came from. So, at the end of this, I had ten Bag for Life bags stuffed with these mildly clunky packages like this, okay? And I thought, how the hell am I going to post all of these? Because they closed all the post offices in Shepherd's Bush where I was living at the time, which was a source of great annoyance to me, because I used to go to the main Shepherd's Bush post office. There'd always be a mad person in the queue. Uh, it'd always be about 20 minutes long. I could write a Metro article about him, 250 quid in the pocket bank. So that was, <laughs> by closing it, they denied me a source of revenue. I had to stop doing that column because there was nothing else to write about. The nearest post office, over half a mile from my house, had ten bags. I thought, I can't take all those up there. It's take too long. So I thought, what I'd do, I'd go out under the cloak of night, half fill all the post boxes within about half a mile of my house. Someone would come in the morning and empty them. It's sort of a victimless crime. But I, I overestimated how big a post box is. The first one I got to, immediately completely full. Because these things fall. They're a little cage inside. They fall in a weird way. It fills it up. I went to the next one, filled that up. I went out the next morning. None of the post boxes had been emptied, so I had to go a bit further afield, fill some more up. Took a couple of bags to the actual post office. But by the end of the evening, at the end of the day, about seven o'clock, I had two bag for life bags left for these things. I thought, well, the post has definitely been collected now. I'll just go out, take it. That's the end. 
As I approached the nearest post box to my house, there was a postman parked outside at seven o'clock. What's going on? There was a postman at the post box. He was emptying. He's, he seemed to be having some difficulty. He was annoyed about something. I don't know what's going on, but I thought, great, if I can just get to him, he can just chuck these packages in the back of his van. I thought, I won't do it. So I ran. I thought, oh God, I'll never get there. I'll go, but I got there. I couldn't believe I went, mate, this is fantastic. Uh, can I put my packages in the back of your van, please? He said, no, fuck off. And I said, I beg your pardon. You can't talk to me like that. I'm a customer. He said, I can talk to you like that. I've seen your packages there, mate. I know exactly who you are. You've been round every single post box within a mile of it, filling it to the brim with these fucking packages. People are ringing the post office up all day saying we can't post our letters. You're a very selfish man. I'm two hours late on my round because of you. I can't, you can't take these things out. You're not going to post things like this in a post box. I said, what are you talking about? If it fits in the slot, you can post it. That's the system. He said, that is not the system. <laughs> Certainly not in this quantity. I said, oh, well, there should be a little sign on all the post boxes, shouldn't there? Three items or less, and there is, and you can put them in until there's no more room to put them in. There's the system. He says, not the system. You're going to take them to the post office. I said, you've closed all the post offices. He said, there's one up there. I said, that's half a mile away from here. I don't live in this post box. I live way over there. I've had to walk here up there. I'd have had to do it five times. That's six, seven miles I've had to walk. I'm not doing that. It's ridiculous. He said, mate, you're in trouble. You're a selfish prick. These things aren't meant to be posted in a box. Look, I'm having such difficulty getting this out of the box. Can you see? I think one of these is going to get ripped open. If it doesn't get ripped open, I'm going to rip it open. I'm going to find out who you are. I'm going to find out your address. You're going to get a letter. You're going to get a fine. You're going to have to pay for what you've done. I said, was that not the stamps? I, <laughs> I paid a thousand pounds in stamps. I thought the system was, I put that on a letter, put an address on, you post it where it's meant to go. He said, that's not the system, mate. You're a selfish prick. I, I, I said, look, these bags are heavy. And I played a card I thought I would never play. I said to him, mate, I am 50 years old. <laughs> I wasn't even, I was a month off, but it didn't. He said, I'm, I'm 42, you're only eight years older than me. I said, really, you look really good. He said, I work out. <laughs> he looked, I thought he was 25. I thought he'd think I was decrepit. He picked up one of my bags. He said, my 75-year-old grand could carry that up to the post office. You're being pathetic. I said, listen to me. Are you going to put my parcels in the back of your van or not? He said, there is no way I'm putting my, your parcels in the back of my van in a million years. I said, if you don't put them in your van, shall I tell you what's going to happen? I'm going to wait till you've driven away, then I'm going to fill all the post boxes right to the top. <laughs> he said, if you do that, mate, I can guarantee you every single one of your letters will end up in a skip. I thought, fucking hell, I know I'd spent weeks writing these things. I'd never, they wouldn't get to the people they're meant to go to. I couldn't remember what I'd written in them. This was a nightmare. And I was starting to realise this guy was quite a nice guy. We'd had a little bit of a laugh. He was, I'd inconvenienced him accidentally because I hadn't understood that there was more than one collection a, a day. But I was worried for myself. You know, I said to him, mate, I'm really sorry. Look, I, maybe I have been selfish. Please don't throw my letters away. Can I give you some money for the inconvenience I've caused you? I was trying to bribe him. He said, I don't want your money. He was the one honourable postman working in this country today. He was, he was doing that job because he loves delivering letters to their intended destination under quite specific postal conditions. <laughs> he said to me, mate, what if all businesses behave the way you have? I said, oh, no, 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 I'm not a business. I'm just a bloke. And I think at that point you realised I wasn't a selfish business and trying to cheat the system of a few pounds. I was just a confused 50-year-old man who didn't understand how stamps worked. <laughs> he looked at me, he said, I can't believe I'm going to say this. He said, give me your bags. He took my bags, he threw them in the back of his van. We'd, we sorted out, look, we nearly got into fight. He was a really angry with me. We'd nearly got into physical confrontation. But this time we'd sorted it out by talking to each other. And, you know, I think that whole story just shows how much I've matured in the last 10 years. <laughs> but I was thinking, technically, mate, those are my bag for life bags you've got in that van. I, I didn't, that's not part of the deal. I've made a commitment to those that I don't think you're prepared to upkeep. And I'm not like Ryan. I see my commitments through. That's a fifth of my life was bang, gone, if you drive off with that. But I realised I had to be the bigger man. I had to walk away. And I felt the same adrenaline, the same thing from punching someone exactly because I've been that. But I felt good about myself because we sorted it out without violence. And by the end of this story, you know, I think me and that postman, we could call each other friends. <laughs> Admittedly, quite a lot of the packages never arrived. But I think that's just a coincidence. The postal system isn't very good. 
And it's, I know it's not as good a system, it's not as good a story as the, as the fight, is it? There's, there's no girls, there's no booze, there's no punching, there's no punchline. But that's why I think it sums up being 50. <laughs> Just an anticlimax. So I um I hope you've I hope you've enjoyed the show. Um, uh, yeah. I, uh, lovely. <laughs> I I, uh, I hope you like my jokes and um, my observational comedy. I'm very proud of that. I actually respect the guys who can do the proper observational comedy. I can't do it myself. Very much about my own experience, and I hope it resonates. But to come up with generally shared experiences is hard because th there are only two really properly shared experiences in life, which is death, which none of us have yet experienced, so it's pretty hard to do observational comedy about, and unless we all go together. In which case, that Who's Alan material isn't going to seem quite as funny, as it? It's going <laughs> to seem almost tasteless, isn't it? And there's birth, we've all been through birth, of course, but none of us remember it. It's a shared experience we've all been through. And thank God, we don't remember. Do you remember it, mate? Do you, do you remember coming out of your mother's cunt? No, you don't, so it's... <laughs> and you know, I think what's interesting, when I turned 40, it was a massive deal to me, okay? It blew my life apart, I had a proper midlife crisis. When I turned 50, I didn't really even notice it happening. Because when I was 50, I had some stuff in my life to worry about. When I was 40, I was, the universe revolved around me. Now I'm 50, thank God my life revolves around other people. I've realised that comparatively I'm not important. It's, that, it's them that are important. It's, time goes so fast, right? You've got to make the most of this. I can't believe it's 10 years since I did that last show. You're going to get out of here, check your ticket, and realise you've just watched Oh Shit, I'm 60. That's how quickly... <laughs> this goes. So enjoy your time here in the sun, your time here on the beach. It passes by fast enough. You've got to make the most of it while you can. Be like these penguins. They enjoy, they enjoy the climb up the hill. They enjoy the slide down. The, they like skiing. These guys are crazy because they know what life is all about. They know the meaning of life. You should know it too. All of this is not important. All of this is just a comedy contest. That's all it is. <laughs> and I think the reason but hitting 50 hasn't hurt me as badly. It's because I don't feel like I am 50. I think you're very much how old you feel. Age is just a number, and I'm not 50. I'm very much 25 times two. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I love you. Thanks for watching.